as the year goes on, I get closer and closer. To learn new skills and to build new acumen. We can always touch. It's not. When you get that, then you get a lot more excited about being around children. Normal, in a sense, and with all of the changes. Of or how you can transform your own business. I'm developing the whole time, social, emotional. Traditional route of teaching young people. How to set boundaries because this little victim here needs to know how to do it very well. So they use that term. Sometimes expanded them to go up to 40 minutes. All of those things in education, of course those things are important. Student is going to our heads and our lungs. The affirmations in the mirror for about two minutes. What did you do in order to get yourself going? This is amazing. It happens what seems to happen quite a bit in our school. For the families to come and they uh, that really for the child or is it for us or for the parent. And doing new things for our brain. Who's orchestrating everything in this universe? Which parts of the brain uh, are used on that map that we have. See you with your smiling face. At all, thank you very much for allowing me to join you. Namaste to you, my friends. Welcome everyone to this week's Spotlight and today we have Evelyn Knight with us and I was so excited to reach out to her and have her give a positive response to being here. Hi Evelyn, thank you. Hi Marianne, thank you for having me. Well, I'd like to tell everybody a little bit about you before we get started. Um, and first of all, um, I'd like to say Atul will not be joining us today, but he sends his best and looks forward to listening to the show when he's in a place where he can do that. Um, I'm Marian Harmon, the founder of Music with Mare, and today we have with us Evelyn Knight, and she believes that all children deserve the love that they are not receiving in our society today. She's on a mission to change the world by providing that love to our youngest children and achieves this through the child care center she owns and the child care business of professionals, which is a company that helps centers achieve business success with an emphasis on nurturing high quality research based standards. Her educational background is in neuropsychology and early childhood education. She has been the owner of centers. She has taught and she travels extensively talking on this topic that is, she is so passionate about. And I am excited to hear and learn more than I just learned um, while just talking with her before the show started. So welcome, Evelyn. Thank you. I want to begin by you speaking to your mission and what brought you here. So I've been in early childhood education as far back as I can remember my whole adult life, basically. But I was um, working for a preschool chain and I realized that they really didn't put what was best for the children first. So I created my own program and became a child care center owner. I also realized that in this industry that I'm in, um, people don't know how to run child care centers. It's not like a normal business. So I wanted to help. I wanted to help owners be successful and learn how to run a successful child care center. Through that, I further learned that people don't know what's best for children. <laughs> In our society, what we have, what we're really seeing is the commercialization companies are trying to sell to parents and providers. And so people have picked up on these things thinking it's what's best for children, but it's not. We're not meeting the children where they are. The other thing I'm really seeing is that children are not getting the love they deserve. 
if you look at a child's average day, they are dropped off in care very early. They stay in a child care center all day. They're picked up, they're ran to their next sporting event or whatever. Then they go home, they eat dinner, they are given a bath and they go to bed. And then the next day they do it again. On their weekends, the parents are so busy catching up with house cleaning, grocery shopping, just getting life that they're not taking the time. They don't have the time. They're very well-meaning, but they don't have the time just to sit down and show these babies and children the love that they deserve. So my mission has become to affect at least 1 million children by helping child care center owners and directors around the world learn the business of child care and why it is so important to put research-based standards first, absolutely putting what is best for the children in every classroom first. So I know I can reach that 1 million children by helping owners and directors out there learn how to run healthy exactly. child businesses. That's wonderful. And I, I love that you are so passionate and that you, real, you're authentic. That's the word, authentic. Thank you. And you've gotten to travel and help actually get some of these centers on what we should call a better focus of understanding what their what their focus should be because yes. so many are well intentioned but thinking children should be reading by the time they're four right and yeah when we know children need that feeling of love and self worth and self ability which yes. is more important so we step backwards and think about how people think well, when they get to school, that's when we start. Or when they get to be four, that's when we start. But we know it starts right in infancy. And Absolutely. I know that you have some really yeah. interesting research about that. And I would love for you to share that, why it's so important to start when the child is born. Well, and in fact, it starts before birth. For One birth. of the things we make assumptions that children are born or babies are born blank slates, but we now know through research that that is not true. Children mm -hmm. are not born blank uh, slates. When they are born, they already have a sense of social emotional competencies. They're already, their ability to learn is already there. We just need to nurture that. But if we look at where children, their brains are wired, and if we follow their neurological trajectories, we really need to focus on that nurture and love from day one. It is the most important thing we can do, especially in those first six weeks of life. That is when children are learning how to form relationships. They're learning how to bond. They're really learning to get close to somebody and bond. In the first 18 months, they're learning how to establish trust. If a provider doesn't show up for them, doesn't nurture them for their entire life, they're going to deal with mistrust. They're not going to know how to trust other human beings. It will be a struggle for their entire life. It's so sad mm -hmm. because it it's works. so simple. It's such a so simple. simple. So simple. Just loving them, show, talking to them, looking into their eyes, having that back and forth, laughing with them, just holding them and letting them feel you. That's all it takes. A lot of times we underestimate the power of interactions. In my child care centers, we start from birth. I have a specialty license that actually allows me to take babies from day one. And wow. yeah, it's and partially because we do care for foster babies. So uh, we don't get them very often. Only a couple times in my career have we taken them. But if a baby is in the foster system, we can take them from birth. And I actually do have a curriculum, but it's not what most people think. Most people think, well, the curriculum means that we have these standards, <laughs> but it's not. What it is, is it's overall standards for interaction. It's overall standards for making sure children are nurtured and well, properly loved and cared for. We also know now that the psychological basis that we have as adults even formed as an infant. 
the results of how parents and caregivers interact with a baby is actually constructing your psychology, yours and mine. That's how ours was built. So it's really fascinating. Um, Berkeley University has done a lot of studies. Dr. Ross Thompson has done a lot of work on this area of really that psychological construct that is so important. Uh, so in my child care center, for example, I don't have things like swings, bouncy seats, bumbos, all the traditional contraptions. Any Think of anything that is a contraption that you strap a baby in. We don't have that. Mm. And the reason we don't is because I want my caregivers on the floor holding those babies. I want them talking to them, interacting with them. And when you put babies in these confining contraptions, basically it takes you away from them. And it takes that focus away from that human touch and the human interactions that babies desperately need in order to grow and in order to really uh, have their brains really expand in the way that they need to. So what people should be doing with the babies is giving them attention. Yes. Smiling at them. Yep. Talking with them. I often say in, um, in my workshops, I do um, several workshops on working with infant toddlers and using music. And the most popular one's called Tapping Those Tiny Toes. But one of the things I said is that if you are looking at a baby and you're frustrated, the baby doesn't know it if you're smiling. The baby doesn't know it if you're using a tone of voice. So, you know, like if you, this is the third dirty diaper today and you're wondering what did mom feed this child? You know, if you're looking at the child and you're going, I don't know what your mom fed you. Um, they don't yes. realize you're frustrated. They just like, she loves me. Look at that. That's, yes, you know? yes. yeah. And that's what's most important. It's not extremely difficult job. It's an exhausting job. Yes. But it's basically something we all are innately born with that genuine, you see a baby and you want to take care of it. Yes. Right. And absolutely. So and you're absolutely right. If you put a smile on your face and you're just excited and the tone of voice that you're using is excited, that's all that matters. It doesn't matter like, yes, how you're feeling on the inside. But one of the things I want to point out too, is it is okay to show your baby the range of emotions because they are learning emotions mm -hmm. and emotions like sadness and anger and um, frustration. They're okay emotions. We just have to teach our youngest children how to identify and how to manage them. And so when I'm training my staff, one of the things I tell them all the time is we never stop talking. You are going yes. to literally feel like a newscaster, right? Where you are, or actually a sportscaster where you're doing play by play by play by play. And even though we think a lot of times babies can't understand, they're developing the ability to understand. So it is never too early to say things like, I am really frustrated right now because and then just really explain it, but watching your emotions, not allowing them to get overly out of control, having emotional intelligence yourself is mm -hmm. so important when you're raising any young child from infancy on, because then you're going to pass that emotional intelligence off to your child. What people really don't correlate a lot of times is you see this little itty bitty infant and we don't understand that the interactions and the things that we're doing with them today are going to translate when they're 20, 30, 40 years old. The insecurities we have, the um, our, our lack of confidence, all of that actually was established in us in the first three years of life. So that is why our roles, when anybody, a parent at home, the caregivers in a childcare setting, our role is vitally important because who we show up as, as adults, that actually came to us in those first formative years of life. Yes. So 
Would you take a moment then to discuss, um, I know this wasn't in our list, but with you talking about the, the emotions and early on, people get sometimes discouraged or worried that I shouldn't ever let the child see me get frustrated yeah. or be sad. Um, right. And actually, I love the way Peter Alsop describes it as that feelings are neither good nor bad or negative or positive. They're comfortable or uncomfortable. Yes. And, yes. You know, the comfortable ones bring us joy. The uncomfortable ones get us to change things that are not comfortable. So yes. this is where mirror neurons start. Yes, absolutely. And so can you exactly. talk about that? Yes. Yes, and I think that's it's very important to note that we don't want to hide our emotions from children because if we do, we have to stop at and ask ourselves, what are we teaching the child, right? If we always seem happy and then the children get to a point where they aren't happy about something, they're going to be confused. They're going to wonder mm. why, what is going on here? And then that will lead to shame, right? They'll feel uh, like, why this feeling isn't normal. And of course their cognition isn't quite like ours. So they can't reason through it like we can. Right. So that's why it is important to allow children to see your full range of emotions. There are things in life that are going to make you sad and that's okay. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be angry. It's what we do with our anger that makes anger more of a negative emotion. Right. But there are things that are going to make us these way. Things like anger, things like fear, frustration. Those are our brain's ways of having red flags that something is wrong and we need to fix it. And that is a healthy thing. So we can train babies and young children from a very early age just by talking to them in that you're, I see that you're frustrated with the situation let's try to figure out a way to make it better. And then as they get older, in the beginning when they're little, well, even in a, a one-year-old baby, you can still allow them to try to work through their frustration on their own, right? We don't always want to step in and fix everything. We want to allow them to work through things on their own. And then when they do, praise that accomplishment. And what you're doing is you're teaching them that, yes, things get difficult, and it's okay to be frustrated, but let's find a solution for that frustration. And when they do, you praise the accomplishment because then it gives them that sense of self-worth, self-confidence, so that when they are eight years old and they're struggling to learn how to tie their shoes, they're going to persevere, they're not going to give up, and they're going to keep trying. Same thing like in a college class, right? When you are in a college class, it's extremely difficult. What is it that keeps us persevering? We learned that in those first five formative years, that ability to persevere, not give up, not allow our frustration and anger to overcome and control us. That's literally what we're helping these children learn in those first five years. And that is so much more important than if they could read Kafka by middle Absolutely. school. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And I know before we were recording, I was telling you about how uh, one of the things I love educating people on is the American education system. We are usually in the mid thirties when it comes to quality care in the modernized world, our nation ranks very low. And yet we spend the most money on education per child in the world. If you look at a nation like Finland, they focus solely on social emotional development for the first seven years of life. Yet by 12 years old, their children are outperforming ours. So here we are pushing children to learn how to read, to do this really tough math. When they're three, four, five, and six, in Finland, they don't even start till seven, yet their children are ahead of ours by the age of 12. So, I find it just fascinating that we're just not focusing nearly enough on social emotional development. Yes, that is. On, but fortunately, people are becoming more aware of that component of a person. People where maybe five or 10 years ago, 
you could say EQ and no one would have any idea what you're talking about. Yes. Now at least they're starting to get familiar with these terms. Yes. And hopefully this means that we're, you know, on the verge of changing things. Um, and I, I just want to believe that. Okay, Evelyn. I do too. I do. And I do see, I am, I am seeing a trend as for where social emotional development is starting to become priority in early childhood education, which it should be. And uh, I think one of my concerns is starting that from birth, from yes. birth. Absolutely. Because it yes. does start from a very early age. Yes. And then, you know, they say the different personalities of the babies when they do all that research. And now we know that that's really the different personalities of the mommies. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right? So um, I did post up here that Evelyn's happy to take questions. Um, I know that this is um, a later time than we usually do because of daylight savings times change. So um, we're going to go back next week to starting at the 1030 time. I think it works better for everybody. But in the meantime, if you do come on, please post a question or a comment. Um, Evelyn would be happy to answer you. Absolutely. But for now, I'm going to ask another one. Okay. okay. <laughs> Each age and stage is different. And we know that. Which things should always be in place from the beginning and which things get added as at a more age specific? So I think the one thing that always, no matter how old your child is, is that nurturing and loving component. You cannot show your children enough love and nurturing. Just that constant loving interaction, saying the words. Um, in our society, we really, I think worldwide conversations are so lacking and that ability to just feel unconditionally loved and safe. Mm -hmm. And when you show your child that unconditional love and they know that there's safety in that, when they do get to those tough years, when they, I have an eight, my son just turned 18, right? Those years of oh, those teen years can be so hard when they know that you love them unconditionally and things get hard, they'll be able to approach you and say those hard things. They'll be able to, those things that are tough, right? Those things that could be life-changing that we need to hear. So no matter what age, but from birth, they need the nurturing and the love no matter what. And then as the children grow, we need to be able to give them more independence. And a lot of times, that can be hard on us because we lack the patience, right? So for example, when it's time to allow a child to hold their own cup, we tend to want to put them in water bottles and sippy cups because we don't want to deal with cleaning up the spills, but mm. we need to embrace the spills. It's okay when a two-year-old spills, they're learning. And when we really shy away from those messes, right? we're really not allowing them to grow and learn. When a, a two-year-old puts their shoes on backwards, let it be. It's not going to hurt them. It's not going to, be, I've heard parents say like, well, their feet will be uh, transformed. No, they won't. They're okay. But what you're telling them is you're celebrating the accomplishment, right? When they mm -hmm. put those, so let me point, paint the picture for you. If, a child puts their feet on the wrong foot and you go to them and you say, oh, that's the wrong foot. We need to change that. What did you just teach that child? Oh, what yeah. message are you sending them? You're telling them that they're not competent, that mm -hmm. their effort wasn't good enough, that it doesn't matter that they just accomplished or tried to do something on their own, right? Mm -hmm. So instead, if you approach it as, oh my gosh, you did that all by yourself. I am so proud of you what, how is that different, right? You're showing them that you are just lifting them up. It shows love. It shows that they did something. You're giving them that self-confidence. I have parents come to me all the time for just my child would do this and that. And I'll go back to the example of tying shoes. They wonder why can't my nine-year-old tie their own shoes? And I just always think to myself, well, you were probably the parent that had to correct them every time they did something wrong instead of celebrating the wins. 
like putting their coats on backwards, right? A lot of times when they're first learning to put their coats on, on their own, they put it on backwards and they just slip their hands through. I see parents all the time and caregivers like, oh, we got to fix that. That's not okay. Why isn't it okay? Ask yourself honestly, why isn't it okay? The child accomplished that all by themselves. That is wonderful that they did that all by themselves. They try to pour themselves a glass of milk. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're going to spill a little bit. But if we don't allow them to do these things, we're going to have 12-year-olds and 15-year-olds who don't know and don't have the confidence in themselves to try to do things on their own. So as a child grows in scaffolds, we need to have the patience and we need to allow for the time to let them make the mistakes and solve the problems on their own. And when they have these small accomplishments, we need to celebrate those accomplishments instead of trying to fix it all and making it perfect all the time. Right. Perfect. Perfect is not a reality. It's not. There's no such thing as perfect. Right. You know? And if we wait for perfect, we're never going to be happy. Yes. Of, you know? Yes. Um, so if someone is watching and they have a child care facility, right? Mm -hmm. And I'd like you to share some of your experiences in working with others to help set up child care businesses, what it is that you do. And um, share with us where you believe there was a time when you really made a big impact and how. So maybe someone watching this, they say, I need Evelyn Knight. Yes. So I, I actually have a video of somebody wants to see on my page uh, just about two weeks ago, a couple of my clients went on and made a video of the impact that I've made in their life and their oh, um, own centers. Yes. Uh, one of the biggest things I think I'm most proud of right now is uh, I have a client that's in Panama and Panama does not have any kind of early childhood regulations whatsoever. Hmm. My client in Panama had actually went and on my video and basically explained, which I didn't know this. It was so touching. I almost cried live on video when I, when she said this, of course. but um, she basically said that using my teachings and the guidance that I've helped her with through her membership with me, she has actually started an organization that's similar to the United States NACI, the National um, Association of Education for Young Children for Panama. She's like basically gathered other owners and directors, put this together. She's getting the help of a university and they are taking on the government of Panama through the yes. work that I do. It is just, I was just like, oh my uh, God, that's just crazy. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that's it is amazing. But wonderful. And then daily, just a normal everyday center is one of the things that I've really done was helped owners to free themselves from thinking they have to live at their childcare centers. I see so many owners who don't know, they don't understand the business of childcare. So what ends up happening is they're there 12 hour days, five to six days a week, thinking they have to do everything. And then they're not even keeping the children. And so I think the biggest impact I've had is helping them learn the time management of business basically and the financial management of business and how when you put the children first and you really focus on what is best for them your classrooms the they suddenly become easier on your children the children's behaviors improve the teachers um job is easier your parents stay they don't leave they uh you're like for me i have a 300 child wait list at my center. And that just oh, no. naturally happens when you put the children first. And then when you marry that with the best business practices, you can be successful. You don't have to work yourself to death and you can still make a healthy income. Wow. That's, you, you, you deserve to feel as proud as you probably do because you are impacting so many people and teaching such simple tools. Yes. I would think that many, a lot of professional centers like corporate centers and, you know, that sort of thing, they, they're focused on the bottom line. Yes. Um, the profit. 
And yeah, we all know that you don't have a business just because you love children. You do have to turn a profit, keep the business open. You yeah. need to be able to survive that way. And I'm, I think that um, I would think that a lot of people don't understand how the both of those go hand in hand. Right. And I think you described it there. But I think that might need some reiteration. Absolutely. So and I can say I was once a failing owner myself. I did not understand. And and I honestly thought that best practices were too expensive, that I could not keep a successful business going if I followed best practices. Right. At that time, I was facing bankruptcy. I did not have, I, I couldn't keep parents in my doors. I could not keep at my capacity. I couldn't charge enough to pay my bills. One day I just kind of got tired of it, of knowing I wasn't putting the children first. And I just decided, you know what? I'm not making any money anyway. So we are going to do what's best for the children. And from the business world's view, worldview, right? I, it would have been crazy what I did. But I had an infant room that was licensed for 21 infants, which is oh my goodness, awful, right, right. So one day I just was so in my own heart and soul, I was so disgusted by the center I owned that I decided I can't do this anymore. This is not me. It is not my love for children. It is not what God called me to do. So what I ended up doing was I took that 21 and shaved it down to eight to eight children, mm. to eight babies. And I basically did that throughout my entire center. And I was, at the time I was averaging about 130 children a day and I cut it to 90, right? Mm. As a business owner, I thought I was committing business suicide. <laughs> and I thought, and I'm sure it doesn't sound practical, but the result has been that I have become way more successful by putting the children first. It was insane to me where I no longer struggle to enroll children. I can charge more. Um, I get more subsidy and grants, which is my passion is really to make sure all children have access to my care. So I really try to make sure that um, all parents can afford. So we do have other ways to fill gaps, but it was really mind blowing to me that going against the normal frame of mind for a business person actually made me more successful. Um, but there, that being said, there are business practices I also had to put in place. And I actually went and got a business coach myself. That business coach was not childcare specific, but I learned things like um, how to manage employees better. I learned things like delegating, how to have a proper organization when it came to your management, how to properly run business finances. Uh, a lot of business people think they're great at their household finances. I can do this with business, but it's not nearly the same, not nearly the same. The other thing um, I learned is that when, in order to do what's best with children, your staff needs to really be educated. And I realized that I had to learn how to duplicate myself. So that's another thing I developed is a method of duplicating myself over and over again. And that's what I teach my clients as well. So I teach them that that is really how you're going to do what's best for the children, putting them first by duplicating best practices every single time you hire someone new, right? And it, it's not easy to do if you don't know how to do it. So I hope that answered your question more clearly. It does. It does. So I just want it to be clear for other people because um, we're getting near the end here. And I am. My desire is that people will hear you speak and want to connect with you because they realize that is the missing piece. Yes. I need to talk with her yes. and learn how I can turn things around. I think one of the things I teachers will say, like, for example, I did a workshop one time for um, K through eight teachers and the vice principal was in the room. And I went through all why you're not teaching music, you're using music to teach. 
and why it's so important. And the principal hears the whole thing. And he said, this was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. But we're never going to use it because we just, we can't do that. Oh, yes. You know, yeah. and so th the teachers get, wow. Yeah. So I can't, I can't do that. And that's, I think, how sometimes um, owners of centers yes. are like, I want to do that, but the parents are yeah. not going to like it. Yep. You know, I, I'm like, why do you have four? I walked in a place and I saw journals for four year olds, lined journals. Oh, wow. And I said, what are these? Well, we have to have those. I said, why? Well, the state, I said, no, the state did not say they needed to have lined journals. journals. Yeah. You know, right. you, there's so much misinterpretation is yes. my point. Yes. And, and directors and owners are so confused because- and Overwhelmed, yes. Yes, there's so much misrepresentation. Yes, um, absolutely. So how, how going from let the children start doing journal writing and by that we mean they drop exactly they you blah 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 that the, gets turned into a book with lined right oh my goodness to be creative with, to controlling what they do yes exactly so yes. people need to learn the ways that they can implement this and yep. still not fall out of the parameters of what the state is expecting and i think even more importantly teach the parents not to expect so that, much yes and, and that is what it, well and that was one of my biggest fears too before i made this shift and, and became a i consider it a mature child care center owner I was so afraid that I would not be able to uh, enroll parents, that they would mm -hmm. see my program and I didn't look like the program down the street that was really academic and they wouldn't want to enroll their parents. But I got to the point where I didn't care anymore. I had to do what was best for the children. What I found is that parents want what is best for their children. They just don't know what is best. So part of my exactly. program, yes. And when you educate, it just takes a matter of educating parents. I do teach my clients how to educate them very quickly, how to educate your community, how to educate every parent one tour at a time. Uh, and that is a big component. And one of the things I'll add is if you have a program and you are seeing a lot of behavior issues, if your teachers are quitting and you cannot retain staff, if parents are leaving and you feel like it's a revolving door of enrolling a new child, losing a child, you're not following high quality pro, uh, standards. When you put those standards in place, all of that changes. You suddenly will retain, your behavior issues go down, your parents stay, your teachers stay, and you become in demand, right? Because the parents do see a difference the results of what the children go home with are so different. And those centers that are doing what they think is, I call them parent pleasers, right? They think if they send home a bunch of workbooks that they're doing these parent pleasers, they have other problems. Like their child, their children are being bit and hit. And there's a lot of behavior issues happening in those centers. And that is very disturbing to parents. So that is what's causing a lot of these revolving doors on these centers. So when you change it and really focus on the development of the child, it eliminates so many of these other problems. That's what makes your business more successful in the long run. And I do teach on all of that. I know it, I, I can say it and it sounds so easy and I know it's not. I do actually address and help owners and directors learn how to get that under control, how to get the messaging out to their parents and their teachers. Sometimes teachers are very resistant as well. Oh yeah. Oh yes. So um, you can put in the um, feed under this video, if you would, your um, contact information. Okay. Um, and I, what would be the steps for people to get in touch with you and how would that work? 
Yes. And you know what it is? It's letting me write in the private chat on this, but StreamYard is yeah, not well, me. I know. I and that's that's why I need a tool. Yeah. Uh, I, in order to put the comment up about taking questions, I had to go on my phone. So. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. And I know that we have a. a um, I can do that too. I'll just go in my phone and put it in the chat. Yeah. And so um, people can get in touch with you. Do you have a, a, a website? I do. English? My website is a childcarebusinessprofessionals.com. And I also have a podcast, The Child Care Business Coach, which is on the screen there. Uh, I have a YouTube channel, Facebook channel. I'm everywhere. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, we're all spread thin across social media nowadays. We it, are. <laughs> sometimes I, when it first started, there was none of these things. Well, at least when I first started. And, and now it's just like overwhelming. But they are good tools. They and, are, definitely. Um, they're great to make available for parents and teachers. Um, and I wish that, that we had a couple people on to ask questions, but that doesn't appear to be the truth right now, but I know that they will watch later. So Absolutely, I, um, yeah. And yeah. if you want, if anybody watching wants to find me on uh, Facebook, of Evelyn Knight on Facebook, you can always uh, message me questions. I'm more than happy to continue the conversation. Well, I think that the combination of your um, neurological background with your business, with your savvy of understanding children and families is a wonderful trifecta for um, putting together a great and dynamic um, child care centers. So I encourage people to get in touch with you. Um, I would love to have you back on and talk about another topic at some time. Yeah. And, um, really, is there any um, parting comments you would like to make? I would just like to basically just say that don't worry so much about what commercialization of parenting and child development is telling the world we need right now. And really look at where is your child's brain developing? That is the most important thing. There is a lot of people out there who are trying to sell you on a product, but the products aren't always what's best, right? So just know where is your child's brain right now? Look for those resources that really show you that brain trajectory and focus on those. Room uh, is a very great, uh, they have some great online resources. Oh, that, I love them, yes. Yep, very great, they all have activities and different things to do, but that are really helping your child's brain develop where it's actually meant to be developing instead of starting them too fast, too soon. And that's, um, for those of you listening, Vroom with a V. With a V, yes. Yes. Um, thank you so much. I think that everything you had to say was so very valuable. And thank everybody you. else, um, we'll be back in two weeks. We now will be doing these biweekly instead of every week. And we'll be back to the 10.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time um, in two weeks from today. So thank you, Evelyn. And everyone else, we're very happy to have you here, whether it's right now live or later. Thank yes. you. Thank you.